economy's journey has brought us to Ireland this week, where we will look at the ups and downs of Europe's housing market and how it influences our financial health. On the show, we'll break down the impact housing has on our consumption and investment decisions. We'll take a look at how Ireland has been dealing with its housing crisis and analyze with one of the country's most well-known economists, David McWilliams, the footprint of housing on household debt. We all know there is a direct correlation between housing and the economy. So let's really get a grip on how our homes influence our consumption and investment decisions and therefore our financial stability. A house is typically most people's largest asset. As the value of our homes increase, our consumption increases as well. We spend and invest more because we feel richer. We also tend not to save as much since we can raise more money from our home. When you buy a house, it also has a bigger impact on the economy than simply buying, say, a car. Your estate agent makes a commission. You spend money on furniture, appliances, remodeling the house, repairs, etc. Your house then directly impacts the investment decisions of those businesses. Most properties today are a leveraged purchase. At the height of the boom, it was possible to have double mortgages to buy houses with almost zero down payment. Such high leverage directly impacts stability. Big profits can be made when prices rise, but if they fall, the asset value also drops. Homes lose their value, consumption falls, and we end up with volatility. High leverage also means banks are making big bets, creating a double layer of instability, which could result in large losses or even bailouts, as we've seen during the financial crisis. Every housing market is different, both structurally and in its cycle. So with a broad brush, we can say Eurozone house prices were down 1.3%, or that EU prices were down half a percent. But when we get into specifics, like quarterly prices in Estonia, Ireland and the UK jumping the most, or those in Denmark and Romania falling the most, we have to remember the housing market conundrum is driven by very different factors. Europe's housing market is of two types, one with more demand than supply, the other with too much supply, like Ireland and Spain. Between 2000 and 2007, Spain built too much. This was accompanied by a rise in house prices, which then resulted in the crash in 2007-2008 due to excess supply. By contrast, there are countries like France and Britain, two good examples, where you have demand outstripping supply, especially in big cities. What about the role of central banks and interest rates? As part of the economic cycle, monetary policy has been used to support the housing market so it can bounce back. In terms of the UK, interest rates are dramatically low. Consequently, buying a property is very attractive because it is possible to borrow at rates which are at historically low levels. Extremely bas sur leur moyenne historique. So, how is the health of the housing market assessed? There are some fundamental indicators. We know with a fair amount of accuracy, for instance, given demographic developments, how many people will move house. There are also ways to find out if the housing market is expensive or not. For example, the relationship between the price of an average property times the buyer's annual salary. In France, it averages out at about 3.8 years. It's a little bit more for the UK, a little less for Spain. But in general, these averages hold good in most European countries. Those regional differences make a pan-European recovery more difficult. The incomplete and deserted former Anglo-Irish bank building behind me is just one example of a property crash that led Ireland to a bailout which it has now exited. The country is expected to grow 1.8% this year and property prices, which still are 50% below their peak values, jumped 4% in the last quarter of 2013. Sales? Well, they were up 10%. But Ireland's problems are far from over. Sebastian Abelzik has this report. In Ireland, one in five mortgages today is not being repaid. These families protesting outside the Irish Parliament fear eviction. Paul Casey finds himself in that situation. 
He invited us to his home, a three-room flat, which he paid €275,000 for in 2005, but currently has a market value of only €100,000. He still has 20 years left on his mortgage. We have no ability to move beyond this apartment. We can't buy anywhere else. We can get a loan to get another mortgage to move on. So we're kind of trapped here in this little two-bedroom apartment. It's nine years now and we have, uh, we're still really trapped here and we just, there's no movement. We can't get on anywhere else. Ireland's central bank estimates 140,000 households like this one are in negative equity. Nearly 20% of them risk losing their homes. When Paul bought his flat, Ireland was still called the Celtic Tiger. Between 1997 and 2007, property prices soared by more than 270%. Before the bubble burst in 2008, banks often lent more than what properties were worth. But when the value of housing halved, Irish lenders also went under. Out of the six financial institutions that existed before the crash, only three remain today and two of those are fully owned by the Irish state. Nationally and at the macro level, things look OK. So GDP has started to grow again at above the Eurozone level. Um, house prices have stopped falling and are growing in some places. Unemployment has fallen from 14% at the peak of the crisis to 12% now. So that looks good. But if you look in more detail, the picture is very mixed. Ireland's public debt is still huge. Private debt is also one of the highest in Europe. But the government expects a return to growth. From a lot of the international evidence, it's clear that our problems were a construction and property price bubble. And from all of the international evidence, once there is stabilisation has emerged back to the market and prices grow again, uh, it's quite clear that there's value here to be obtained. And that's why investment is coming back into Ireland. It's not Irish people investing, it's international people investing in Ireland because they see real value in the property market in this country. The government now predicts the property market will bounce back by about 10% in the next two years, but much of that rise is expected in Dublin. I think what we've seen in the last year or so is quite a significant stabilisation in terms of prices. Also in Dublin, uh, where there's very significant economic activity, there has been some rebound in the property market. But there are issues for us around that because we need to see a further intensification of supply. In the rest of Ireland, growth remains sluggish. For Paul Casey, that means it might be a while before he pays off his debt. Housing is Ireland's biggest challenge today. Ghost estates where construction work stopped midway through the crisis are plenty. New bills are extremely rare. This despite the fact that the country's bad bank, Nama, has allocated a billion euros to complete construction projects with half the money already used. So I caught up with well-known Irish economist David McWilliams and began by asking him if the Irish recovery was all that it was made out to be, considering housing is still such a bone of contention. Yes, the economy is turning around, but it's largely because of multinationals and the exporting sector. And the vast majority of people here are employed in the domestic sector. And that's why unemployment remains in double digits. So I would be rather sceptical, not so much about the direction of the recovery, but about the pace of the recovery. And if you have double digit unemployment and what could be described as mass emigration of young Irish people, the recovery is not a recovery, but it's more a statistical observation. When you see the number of households and their debt, do you think this turnaround that we've seen is now less to do with the housing market and that might be a good thing? Household debt in Ireland is the biggest in the world, not just in Europe, but in the world. And absent a debt deal which forgives people their debts, the domestic economy can't grow. And if the domestic economy can't grow, what you'll have is good headline numbers, but the reality on the ground to be quite, quite different. So the housing market here and in Britain is a totally different beast to what it would be, let's say, in France or Germany. A, because we borrow at short-term interest rates and we borrow a lot. And B, because the rental market is not necessarily seen as a stable way of living. Nothing so undermines your financial judgment as the sight of your neighbour getting rich. And that's exactly what happens here. So when you look at the housing market here, have any lessons been learned? Nothing has changed in Ireland at all. What we should have done is put in place a system whereby banks could not extend credit 
to houses and to the building sector in general after what we've gone through. The only limitation to banks extending credit to housing now is the fact that they have no money. But when they become recapitalised, which they will eventually, what we will see then is back to the old boom-bust cycle in Ireland. But what you find in the outside of Dublin, we basically have too many houses built in the wrong place where nobody wants to live. And until that is cleared, you will have this duopoly where Dublin house prices keep going up and house prices in the rest of the country probably keep going down. If we look at the regular Joe on the street who wants a solution, how do you get them to understand okay. the difference between undervalued, overvalued and stable markets? When house prices begin to rise and they become multiples of the average guy's income, you are in a bubble territory. And you're in a bubble territory when far too much credit is extended. For example, if you go into a bank and you say, do you know what, I'd like to buy that house for 100 grand, but my income is 30 grand, and the bank manager says, oh, don't worry, we'll give you 100, and you know what, we'll give you 50 grand on top of that for going on holidays and buy a car, then you know you're in bubble territory. If markets are so different across Europe, do we need some kind of structural change then? The most important thing is that you cannot have a housing boom, unsustainable boom, unless you have credit. That's the key. So what I would do all across Europe, if I was the head of the ECB, rather than the banks lending against today's house price, I would lend against the average house prices of the last 20 years. And if you do that, you cannot have bubbles at all, you, because the banks can't over lend, and therefore their balance sheets can't play tricks in them. So if Draghi really wants to do something, and I don't believe he does actually, but if he really does, he would link credit, not to the house price today, but to the average of the last 20 years. That would eliminate all bubbles, all booms, all busts, and you would have a stable housing market forever. Well, that's a wrap on this episode of Real Economy from a very rarely sunny Ireland. In the next episode, we'll talk about urban growth. Until then, thanks for watching. See you next time.